Hello, happy campers. I'm Damon, and this is David. You got it backwards again, dude. I'm David, and this is Damon. <laughs> very important, yes. Oh, I'm glad we got that sorted out. We are very excited to have all of you with us this summer. Don't uh, even if you know your friends and families haven't exactly managed to get ready this time. <laughs> Hopefully, you've all managed to find your cabins and get your computers set up by now. If not, don't worry. There'll be plenty of time after the knock hockey and dodgeball games this afternoon. Assuming it stops raining. You know, Vegas. Yes, <laughs> indeed. <clears throat> you never know in Vegas, though. In the meantime, Damon, tell them about the talks. There are talks at these sites? I thought it was all crafts and, like, contests and stuff. Yeah. Unlike DEF CON, there are actually talks at B-Sides. Oh, right, 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 right. That's the whole point. Yeah, okay, I forgot. Uh, talks. So, yeah, as many cool ones as we can manage to squeeze into the space. And it was a challenging year on that front. We always thought it was hard to fit in everything at the Tuscany. But let me tell you, this year, we basically have two rooms. Well, streams. Fortunately, <clears throat> it's a non-Euclidean space, so I think we'll be all right. Absolutely. Uh, first, though, the bad news. Um, when we were reimagining B-Sides for the virtual camp, we ended up deciding we needed to lose a few of our favorite features of the physical conference. Um, so this year, you won't be seeing a lot of really popular things like our trainings or sessions like Ask the EFF or Ask a Fed or our entire underground track. However, don't be alarmed, gang. We're not removing from the conference permanently we just had to make some hard choices this year in keeping up with the virtual format. Right. And that said, you know, while we're certainly delivering a pared down space constrained B-sides this year, we're still keeping true to our big tent philosophy when it comes to what happens in those streams, right? You'll find talks across many disciplines and from all of our other tracks. That is very true. And I can't think of a better example of that kind of cross-disciplinary work than our first keynote speaker this year, Dr. Conrad Cording. Conrad is a professor with the University of Pennsylvania uh, Departments of Bioengineering and Neuroscience. And he's also a fellow at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Impressive. Uh, Dr. Cording's research tries to understand how the world, and in particular how the brain works. His current focus is on causality and data science applications. How do we know how things work if we can't randomize? But he's also very excited about understanding how the brain does credit assignment. Right. So let's all give our full attention to, oh, okay, okay. Inside voices, please, everyone. Inside voices. Okay. Okay. Now, all right. All right. Okay. Now take it down to a one. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good, campers. Very good. Okay. And now I need a zero. Right? Zero. All right. Very good. Very good. Okay. I promise we'll all be able to get all the wiggles out when Counselor Nick from the Speaker Operations Bunk walks us through arts and crafts during the break. Until then, let's give our full attention to Dr. Cording and his presentation on brain hacking. Wonderful. Today, I'll talk about brain hacking, but not in the borrowing self-help kind of a way, but hopefully in a slightly more interesting way. So, who am I? I'm a professor at UPenn. I'm between neuroscience and bioengineering. It's one of these weird positions that are just there to help different fields talk with one another. And that's why I'm so excited to be here today. I teach deep learning here. I teach causality. Uh, and of course, I'm involved in doing a lot of research on neuroscience. So I worked on theory in that area, I worked on data analysis, I worked a lot on conceptual integration, doing some physics and a lot of machine learning and so on and so forth. I co-founded the Neuromatch conferences and the Neuromatch Academy, uh, which is a small group experience that we teach every year to 3,500 students this year. And people learn about neuroscience and deep learning there. I'm also a failed experimental neuroscientist. I quickly learned that I'm not so good at running experiments, and that's why I do, th uh, that's why I do theory and data analysis. Otherwise, I'm interested in skiing, hiking, and salsa. You can find me on Twitter mostly as at CodingLab. So, why are we talking about brains? 
ultimately, security is about people, which you, of course, know extremely well. Now, like this, we have the world as a network of people and computers and robots and cars and things like that. But what are the properties of the people that we can talk about? And this is, of course, something that we all hear very much about. Humans are, of course, a major weakness much worse than any technical system, arguably. So uh, if you ask a person, give me your secrets, they'll be like, no way. If you say, well, what about you also get a free screen safe? And that's like, yeah, sure, take whatever you want. Um, but this is this kind of social engineering is, of course, a standard way of thinking. And people have worried a lot about how we can make systems more secure. And ultimately, it, it boils down to having people that are not willing to take those bargains. So let's talk about brains. So I will argue that brains uh, are themselves a matter for security and uh, uh, that they can be the target for hacking and uh, that we might be moving into such a domain relatively quickly. So today I will talk about cryptography and brains. Cryptography is defined as the art of writing or solving codes. Now let's see how that applies to brains. You can say, we want to solve the code of the brain. I want to find out. When I, when I wear my hat as a neuroscientist wanting to understand how brains work, I uh, want to solve the code of the brain. What is it? How does the brain communicate? How is meaning stored in the brain? And there's, of course, two approaches that we can think of. The first one is with known plain text. If I know what the brain wants to do at a given point of time. And the alternative is, with cipher text only, if I don't know what the brain wants to do at a given point of time. And ultimately, I also want to, and I will not be talking about that, to write the opposite. If I understand the code that's in the brain, I can also write into the brain and say, how should I write into the brain so that I maybe start really liking BMWs as car or something like that? Now, but first, what is the code used by the brain? And this is something that I started working on early in my PhD. In fact, in a way, it, it's the thing that drove me into neuroscience. How does the brain communicate? What, what, what do we mean when we say there's a code? So let's see what happens in the brain while we think. Well, first, like every system, let's have the specs of the brain. How big is the brain? What, how is it built? Well, the brain consists of roughly 10 to the 11 neurons. Now, we have between them, there's connections between the neurons. We have roughly 10 to the 15 weights. Those are 10 to the 15 connections between pairs of neurons. And these connections, these weights, are drawn out of 10 to the 22 potential connections. Now, each of the 10 to the 11 neurons could have a connection with each of the others, but not all of them do. Now, if we look at individual neurons, no one quite knows what the computational power of them is. But arguably, every single neuron is equivalent in a way to a multi-layer neural network. Now, every neuron spikes only roughly once per second. So if the spikes is the code that they use, then they're extremely slow. But here's a cool aspect of the design of the brain, which is Compute is exactly where the memory resides. Arguably, the compute in the brain happens at the synapses, the connections between uh, neurons in the brain. And at the same time, so this is where the memory sits, but this is also where the compute happens. So if we think about this uh, as a total perspective, it has amazing compute, you know, like it has 10 to the 11 neural networks, if we think about it, with uh, 10 to the uh, 22 potential weights. So it's a massive system, but it has a ridiculously slow clock speed. Now, if we compare that to an Apple M1, for example, which has 10 to the 10 perfectly boring transistors that uh, do only very simple things, 10 to the 11 bits of RAM, uh, 10 to the 2 uh, compute units, 10 to the 9 clock speed, we can see that uh, it still has a rather impressive amount of compute to offer relative to current computers. But still, you can see they're like sort of in a similar situation, or like 10 to the 10 transistors, 10 to the 9, nine clock speeds. Uh, that is, uh, that is uh, certainly in the same range of where neurons might lie. 
Cool. So now let me briefly mention a fast insight where you can say, well, what is a neuron? So on the left-hand side, you see what's called the dendritic tree of your neuron. You have one nerve cell. It's roughly where this pink dot is. And what they plotted is other dendrites. Now, the dendrites are the structures on every neuron that integrate information coming from other neurons. And what we did in this work with Alana Jones, we asked, well, what is it that they could do? And we, uh, we, ha we compared three architectures, LDA, linear, uh, linear Discriminant Analysis, a linear technique, fully connected neural networks, those are the state-of-the-art uh, methods on, uh, on, uh, on prompts. And here, we, this is, for example, an MNIST case, which is, object, uh, which is character recognition. A single neuron can tell us if, uh, if the input is a certain digit. Uh, with uh, an accuracy that at least is roughly in the same range as if we have little neural networks. So an individual neuron might have remarkable computational powers. Now let's talk about how they communicate. The communication of a neuron to other neurons happens through spikes. On average, as I said before, neurons will spike one time per second. And so what we have is if we listen to them, in fact, that's how a lot of neuroscientists in the early days, would study neurons, you would hear like click, 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 click. And this is, these are the spikes that come out of the neuron. Now, neurons are connected to often very long wires uh, called axons. And across these axons, it's only these digital pulses that really get through it. Now, that doesn't mean that we know what the code is. Now, what could the code be? It could be when every spike comes relative to maybe some global clock. It could be when one spike comes relative to the next spikes. We also, let's say we have multiple neurons, not like the multiple neurons will spike at different times, but sometimes multiple neurons will spike at roughly the same time. For example, if you look at the fourth spike here from the left, you see I drew them aligned with one another. Now, you will ask me, well, what is the code that the brain uses? And I have to let you down on that. We don't actually know at this point of time. So what are the going hypotheses? One of them is what they call rate codes, where they say, well, there's some relevant time scale, maybe 100 milliseconds. What matters is how many spikes each of the neurons produces within a short period of time. That's called a rate code. There's other people who believe that the brain uses a synchrony code, where it doesn't matter when each neuron spikes. It only matters if multiple neurons spike at exactly the same time. There's other people who said what matters is the timing relative to a clock signal, where you could say, no, like the output, what's communicated here is if you want that long vector of when each spike happens relative to some global clock. So there's lots of hypotheses that we have here. So does that mean we can't do anything about brains, given that we don't positively know the code? No. What do you do when you're somewhat clueless about the system? Well, arguably, you first try linear things. And counting the number of spikes that we have in short intervals and doing linear techniques seems like the first step that we can have here. And this is the technique that most neuroscientists do. So all these other ideas about codes exist in neuroscience but they have relatively small communities. So what kind of access do we have to the brain? And like it has, the human brain has 10 to the 11 neurons um, and we cannot get the signals from all of them. That would make our jo uh, job incredibly similar, uh, simple. So here's the result of a study we run with Ian Stevenson. So what he did is he went through the entire literature and asked for the various published papers, when were they published? This is what we have on the x-axis here. And how many neurons would people simultaneously record from? And what we can see is people started recording from roughly two neurons at a time in the late 1950s. And right now, people record from a couple thousand neurons at a time. Those are, of course, the top labs. There's still lots of labs today that only record from a single neuron at a time. So what we can see here is exponential growth. It's like Moore's law. Everything should happen very quickly. Well, no, it turns out that the doubling time here is very relatively slow. So the long-term doubling rate has been roughly every six years. But if we look closely at this graph, it looks like things are speeding up a little bit. 
And what are the reasons for that? Well, at least one of the results of that is that all of a sudden neural recording techniques are very much hyped. Here we, for example, see Elon Musk. He runs the company Neuralink that aims at getting lots of electrodes into brains with the idea that if we have more neurons in there, we have a broader bus, we get more information out of it. At least one side effect of those developments is that it advances the technology we use in neuroscience. And there's suddenly a lot of drive in lots of companies, and this is just one of them, towards allowing us to record from more neurons and to record better from neurons. In any case, this engagement of industry leads to professionalization, and all of a sudden, I think the trend will accelerate and we should expect that we get considerably more information out of brains with say, within, say, the next 10 to 20 years. In fact, DARPA had, a, had an aim of recording from a million neurons within a relatively small number of years. Now, let's talk about known plain text attacks on brain. Now, there's one wonderful thing about brains. In lots of cases, the brains are very willing to work with us. For example, you have patients who cannot move, and these people would like to be able to still type or be able to do things, or at least they can't move the way we can move, but they had a spinal cord injury and their movement is very, very limited. So in that domain, there have been for a long time people doing research putting electrodes into brains. Now, let me give you an idea here. So you take a little grid here, 10 by 10 electrodes, all silicon electrodes. They get inserted into the brain. In fact, they come with this special device. It's a bit like a hammer that goes like boom, and then it's in the brain. And so what they have is they have 100 channels, and on those channels, they roughly see one neuron on each of those channels. And then what we can do is we can try and decode what is it that the person is trying to do. So here's a new study from this year by the Chenoy group uh, that worked like this. They said, okay, now imagine writing an A. And the patient imagines handwriting an A. And we see what's going on in their brain. And you do that many times with them. And then you're like, imagine writing a B and so on and so forth. And then we can ask, well, can we use algorithms to distinguish between when there's an A and when there's a B? Now, that's a known plain text attack. And in, in fact, we can. And this new result just showed that, we can, that they can do 90 characters per minute, which is really spectacular given what the field had been, uh, been doing before. It's not as fast as we type on our keyboards, but it's pretty impressive. And it just uses, it uses deep learning approaches uh, and uh, to, to basically be able to uh, decode the words that they write. And this is wonderful. No? It's, it, it really is promise for patients. I will later argue that it's also not so wonderful because it introduces a new vulnerability to brains. Um, there's other research. There was a paper that just came out, I believe, last week of Chang and uh, the team in the New England Journal of Medicine, where patients were just imagining talking and they could decode the words that were there. And I should also mention my lab has been deeply involved in that area using deep learning based uh, approaches towards decoding things from, you, uh, from, from brain. Usually we work, of course, on animal brains. So, a similar approach here, just uh, to give you another case. Uh, this is from the Schwartz lab, where they use these brain signals to serve a robot, and patients can then self-feed with, uh, with that by just deciding how they want to move that hand. Now, I, I told you that over time, the number of simultaneously recorded neurons grows up. Goes up. And you can directly see that in here. If you want, if you, if you have a prosthetic device that doesn't have enough uh, data rate through it, what's going to happen to it? It's either going to be slow or it's going to be noisy. So what really happens? They do this. They're not very good in that sense. What happens through that progress is that progressively they get more reliable, less noise. And there's been a lot of wonderful tech effort that, that goes into making these devices work better. All of that implicitly forces us to break the codes that are in the brain. And there's a lot of mysteries. We don't quite yet know what's the best way of decoding from brains. 
And I should mention one thing here. Using modern techniques definitely helps a lot. A lot of the field is still using linear techniques, which you can see on the left here. Wiener filters and then Wiener cascades, common filter, and so on and so forth. If we go to the modern deep learning, uh, deep learning systems like LSTMs, we get considerably less noise to it. But of course, much of the, much of the work is also done by prosthetic devices over time get better. Now, uh, what's the, what's the long-term goal here? We take uh, data from motor cortex, we call that M1, we decode, that tells us how, we want, how the patient wants to move the hands, and ultimately, once we can properly break the, uh, break the uh, codes, we hope to be able to get it back, give it back. And that is somewhat working, interestingly, where you can say, we then take what the prosthetic device feels and put it right into primary sensory cortex, which makes it feel a little bit like the actual hand gets touched. Now, let's, let's zoom out a little. What is happening at was I, what I was just telling you about? We have super partial data. Now, we were celebrating that we now record from more than 1,000 neurons. But we're recording from more than 1,000 neurons from a 10 to the 11 dimensional system. Now, that's an interesting problem. Now, like, what can we say about the system if our access is so limited? And we have somewhat noisy decoding. And of course, in this case, um, it's a non-adversarial code design. Now, the brain has not been evolved to produce codes that are really complicated for us. So we may hope that the codes that the brain uses are the kinds of codes that we can relatively easily decode. At the same time, it's a decisively non-human design. Now, like if we break other systems, we are often using weaknesses of the human designers. And in this case, evolution was the designer, which might make things uh, like decoding much more complicated. So um, let's, let's think about a little bit the non-plain text approach that we have here. How does training in these cases work? I tell a patient, imagine moving your hand forward. Or I tell them, imagine drawing an A, imagine drawing a B, imagine drawing a C. And that's, of course, incredibly repetitive. So in a way, people would want you to be able to decode it without non plain text. Now, like they would like to use the prosthetic device as they go about their lives and would like to still be able for the system to decode. Now, why is this complicated? In large parts, it's complicated because the brain always changes. So if you have these, deco uh, if you have these electrodes in the brain and you wait a little, maybe 20 minutes or something like that, then the brain will have reorganized a tiny bit. Now, if you wait two months, then the brain, brain might have reorganized considerably. So you want to have systems that in a way can recalibrate themselves. So it's um, getting rid of the need for known plain text is one important goal in that area. Now, a lot of you will of course know this, but let's briefly review why a cipher text only attack is even possible. So Alice says, hello Bob. It gets translate it into a code that we don't currently know. The code gets transmitted through some line. We are listening in on the line. If we are neuroscientists, no, we have our electrodes in the brain. And ultimately, the code can be decoded, namely maybe in the parts of the brain that, say, that actually use the muscles to say, hello, Bob. So there's the encoding and the decoding component here. And that's, of course, a key, which is, if you want, like the descriptor of what the nature of the code is here. So we have the plain text M, we have, uh, we use a key and, and, and encryption here to convert it into cipher text, uh, a text. We then want to invert this function, which gives us the original message out. Now, why is that possible? We can, in a way, we cannot know what, uh, what uh, Alice wants to say, but we do know that Alice talks English. And therefore, you can say 
we know a lot about what's the nature of English. And here's a nice way of, of looking at that. So it's somewhat dated here, but we can say, well, what if we have the zero gram? We just know this is this character. Well, in that case, we need 4.7 bits to encode every character, namely log two of 27, which is the number of digits that we have. Now you can use the one gram. Now the E is more common than maybe any other character. But we can also use the two gram where you can say, well, the E is more frequent after an R than after a Q and so on and so forth. And there was like an old approach, which, which is IBM Word Trigram. There's also the Shannon game, which is a fun thing where you basically just ask people to guess what the next character would be. And you go in English language and you don't need many guesses to guess what the next character is. So what do we have is we effectively have samples from, uh, from the, from the, set of messages, which is just English language. And then we have a decoder that takes key, K as a key, and that gives us uh, samples of what the decoding would be for an hypothesized K. And now we can say, what's the generic solution for that? We want to minimize uh, minus the KL divergence from Q, the distribution of decoded text, 2p, the distribution of English text in this case, which of course depends on k, and we want to maximize over k. Basically, give me the key for which it gets to be most probable. And this is of course a, pro a, a, a procedure that I hope we will midterm be able to use about the brain, and we'll talk a lot more about that in, in a little bit. So here we get to, uh, to a decoding project by my former postdoc, Eva Dyer. Um, we decoded movement because back then data on speech was hard to come by and there wasn't enough of that. What do we have? So we have a typical distribution of movement. Now, in, the, uh, in practice, we used the, the kinds of experiments they do on monkeys where the monkey always moves like that. But like, here's the, here's the big picture idea. We have a typical distribution of movement. Take my life. In my life, I do a lot of coffee cups moving to my face. In fact, it's my favorite thing in a way. I'm, I'm somewhat obsessive about coffee. Uh, sometimes I have to run. And then, of course, much of my life consists of just moving my hands over a keyboard. So that's arguably the typical distribution of movements. And in fact, early in my postdoc, I measured that distribution of movement where you see during everyday life, where do the elbows spend their time? That's what you see in blue and pink on the other side. Where do the hands spend their time? Which is, see, which is what you see in red and green. It was actually kind of funny. At that point of time, you needed to carry about 10 kilograms of equipment on your back to be able to do those measurements. Today, you could probably do it with the wristwatch and uh, certainly uh, minimal effort. But, but, uh, but that's the thankful development of technology. Now, what's the idea? If you have a wrong decoder from it, the distribution that it will, uh, will produce is not gonna be the right distribution. And now what we want to do is we want to change our decoder so that the output of it looks like the everyday movements. Now, like it's the same idea as we have it with text, where you can say for text, for um, a cipher text only attack, we want to make it so that the probability distribution approximates English. Here we want that the probability distribution of movement approximates those of everyday life. So how does it work? We take the neural data. We have on the x-axis here, we have time up there. On the y-axis, we have the different neurons. And of course, movements happen in relatively low dimensional spaces. So what we do is we do a first step where we do dimensionality reduction, where we project this high dimensional neural activity into a much lower dimensional space. And we also have in a low dimensional space, of course, the kinematics. And then we use distributional alignment. So what we do is we basically to search in some space to find the configuration where these two probability distributions best align with one another. And with this, 
that we can then do decoding without any training data. So we don't need any known plain text data. So what we have here on the on the x-axis you have time. This is 10 seconds of a monkey moving. On the y-axis you have the velocity along the x, di x dimension and along the y dimension. And in black you see the ground truth of the actual movement. In, in red you see what we have if we have supervised data, so if we have the full plain text available, and in blue you see what we get if we if we use this cryptography inspired approach to decode from the brains of the monkeys. And what you can see is we're doing a pretty good job at the, at, uh, at recovering the movements that the monkey is move, is making at that point of time. And of course we can quantify this where we have. Um, uh, where here we have uh, this, this four settings that we can have. The first one is in red, which is the supervised approach. You know, we have the full known plain text, we know exactly what's going on. In yellow, you see we call that distributional alignment decoding, but that's basically a cipher text only approach. The difference between those two is not significant. Now, you can combine those two approaches and you'll do a little bit better. What we can also do is we can use the movement statistics of one monkey and the neural data of another monkey, and we can also decode in that setting, which is quite interesting. You know, that we can uh, that we basically never need both data sets from the same subjects. We have movements from one monkey, and we have brain activity of another monkey, and we can still decode that. And of course, the confidence intervals here are ninety-five percent bootstrap intervals. So. Now, why is that worry, uh, worrisome? In a way, what you saw there is a cipher text only attack, a cipher uh, text only decoder. And in this case, we can decode how the monkey wants to move the arm. And you can say, well, who cares about how a monkey moves the arm? But think about it one step further. Um, you might not you might not tell me your secrets if I ask you for, for your secrets, but there's a very worrisome possibility. What if your inner voice sometimes talks about your secrets? And what if I could get hardware access to your brain, maybe with or without your will? In that case, I should be able to decode your inner voice. Why? Because your inner voice probably speaks English. No? And therefore, I know something about the statistics of your inner voice. And if I know that statistics of your inner voice, I should in principle be able to get it your inner voice. Now, good news is neuroscience isn't quite there yet. Fortunately, we're just recording from order 100, maybe 1,000 neurons at a time. We probably need more to decode interesting voices. But in principle, we are getting into the domain where such things become meaningful. And that's at least something that we might want to worry about. Now, that brings me to a call for ethics. Now, these, these coming neuroscience possibilities are great possibilities for all kinds of medical problems. Now, if you can't speak, you had a stroke, your mouth no longer moves, but you can totally think in your head. It's magical if we can put electrodes into your brain, allow you to speak again. For people that are locked in, for people that had spinal cord injury, hey, I mean, like, in a way, one of the coolest things in that area is, say, Luke Skywalker. Now, you remember in one of the movies, loses the arm, and he has a prosthetic device that is so good that in the rest of the movies, we don't even see that he has a prosthetic device. How is that possible? How could such things be possible? Well, access to neural data, because that's where ultimately all the ones to move are. And incidentally, you might get to lower, uh, lower latency because you don't need to wait until the signal travels from my head to my arm, which is also very desirable. Um, I think we should start worrying before it becomes a real possibility about brain science as a new weakness for humans. If we can record things, and if we have access there, um, then there's, there's, there's ways of doing bad things with it. And, and if suddenly if we hear people like Elon Musk talk about it, and I think he's overly enthusiastic about that and doesn't quite understand the difficulty of things coming our way. But, um, uh, but 
if people start would start building prosthetic de uh, devices that allow them to talk more rapidly with one another, well, that's a channel. And with that channel, they might not just translate what they want to say. They just translate. They, they just transmit what's going on in their brain. And all of a sudden, we might know a lot about them that they don't want to actually broadcast to us. If not, well, what is it that they want to? How can we know what it is that a person wants to broadcast to another? And like, like people like Elon Musk make it sound like having this broadband channel for to another person that that would be very desirable. I personally would be very worried about how I can make sure that I don't accidentally leak all, all, all my secrets kind of over this channel, because it's hard enough to make sure that I don't say really stupid things. Like if I give a talk, I'm always worried. What if I say something that I shouldn't be saying that's potentially obnoxious or something? Imagine I had a bus to the world that was maybe 10 or 100 times broader. I would be broadcasting all kinds of things that I shouldn't. Um, so that's one of them. Um, we therefore, I think we need to think very hard about what would be acceptable. Right? Like people have brain implants routinely in their brains. For example, if you have Parkinson's disease, you know, they build little brain implants into your head that basically zap you regularly and some of them record from brains, for example, for epilepsy as well. So there starts to be data that comes out of brains. We don't currently know what the weaknesses of such systems are. Now. At the same time, clearly, if people go into this implant space, there's a lot of interest in being able to also write into their brain code. And people are extensively working for that. Now, as you know, brain, Facebook has been very interested in interfacing with brains. Um, if you can write to a brain, would it be acceptable to do something to the brain? Well, that's why we, have, why we do write to the brain. But how can we distinguish between just transmitting some text your mother wants you to call her or something like that versus also transmitting oh and advertisements are awesome <laughs> we should all celebrate our advertisements now the, where we should be in that space i think neuroscience will very soon have to grapple with difficult problem now like that might not be happening in two years but it might happen in five years it certainly will happen within the next few decades so i think we should really start thinking about it so that brings me to my uh, to my take home message. So I think brain science has really interesting questions about codes. They have their own way of thinking about codes. Um, I think thinking about codes from many different directions is a very interesting direction. And I don't think there's much debate happening between neuroscientists and maybe security researchers, despite the fact that this will become a problem potentially relatively quickly. It's an incredibly advancing uh, technology space where a lot are happening. And, um, and in a way, research is slowly moving towards the possibility of a CIFA text only attack on human rights. And uh, we probably don't want that to happen. So uh, we should start thinking about how we can build systems that will make it absolutely impossible that these things do happen. And with that, Thank you very much for listening, and I very much look forward to the discussion. Hey, all right. Hello, B-Sides campers. Uh, welcome to the Q&A for our, uh, you know, cutting edge, uh, you know, keynote here. I, I, it's really fascinating to see a, a, an update on some of the, the, the kinds of progress that we've made with, you know, how many electrodes we can stick in a brain and, and actually get something intelligible out of it. Um, Conrad, uh, thank you so much for coming to, to talk with us today. Um, thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, as uh, as you might imagine, you know, a lot of our, our, our folks are immediately the, the, the mind jumps to, oh, my gosh, you know, what can we um, what can we do with this information? How, you know, what are the, the boundaries of, of the, the, the problem? Um, I, we see, you know, you're, you've been talking about decoding um, internal voices with, you know, sticking wires into folks' brains, which is, you know, definitely a problem in itself. Uh, I've also got people asking, well, what happens, you know, how much resolution, how much information can we get with other sensors that don't involve putting electrodes into a brain, for instance? And, and is that even a, uh, something that would uh, apply for the kinds of uh, things that you're talking about? 
Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Like, there's a continuum here where you can say, on the one side, I open your skull and, and I put in 100,000 wires that get, allows mm -hmm. me to get a really large amount of data in and out of your brain. There's the other possibility, what can we do if we don't even open your brain? And this is something that we worked on for a long time. Now, like, I'm sure a lot of you have seen EEGs, where you basically put electrodes onto the head, put them on an amplifier on the outside, <laughs> and you can decode with that. It's just that the data rate that you get through it might be factor 10 plus slower okay. than if you give me a white bus. But there's a lot of tech development in that area. For example, Kernel is one of the companies active in that space who are working to use new techniques to get data in and out of brains. For example, you can say there exist these new ideas of getting optically information in and out of the brain. You'd still need to wear a hat, but you're wearing a hat right now, so that uh -huh. <laughs> that would be a possibility. Um, and uh, so it's optically like lasers pointing at my scalp or, or some sort of retinal yeah. interface or what are we talking about? I think we're talking about lasers pointed at your scalp. And, okay. and, and there is old research in neuroscience, which is if, you, if I put light onto, your, onto the surface of your brain, and, and, and that part of the brain is more active, uh, the light in the, in the range of where there's, there's, the, there's more blood going to be flowing into the, those areas. Okay. That means that then the reflectance of the light will change. Now, so uh -huh. one way of getting light out of it, you no, know, like more blood means it's more red, which means that, uh, okay. that, uh, that there will be more absorption in some areas. Yeah, so yeah, there yeah. exist ways of getting it out. And then there's this cool new stuff, which is what's called optogenetics, where you can say, uh, I can, if, I, if you allow me to get a virus into your bloodstream, I can make your, I can in a way make your cells respond to light so that I can inactivate or activate them with light. And alternatively, there's mechanisms that allow me to get a lot more data from your brain with the same light that goes in and out. Got it. Uh, so, uh, but is the uh, the resolution would be much broader? So you're talking region activation rather than specific neurons. So is, you, is, is that open to the same kinds of things that you're talking about? Or is it just a much more, you know, um, general sense that you can get what's going on yeah no it totally is so so if you give me these low uh, low resolution signals i can still say a lot about what you're thinking about so mm -hmm. for example they they now do these things where they have someone in an fmi scanner that is one of these outside ideas no? like i put you into into a strong magnetic field and then i can with radio frequency get your get your read out what your cells are doing and from those you can you can now decode code say roughly the video that someone is seeing or what kind of words they're thinking about so so you can get uh, relevant information of it it's just a, it's just think about it it's just a smaller bus cool all right um so i mean you would in the in the talk you go in a lot to uh you know movement vision language these kinds of things um what do we know or can we learn about uh, memory contexts and decision making from these kinds of techniques well, neuroscientists have long been into decision making, and uh, in, in, uh, what you what you found find that there's some brain areas where the activity of a lot of neurons say increases as you get closer to making one decision versus another decision. So in that sense, we're quite good in some cases to read out the decision that's going to be made. Um, when it comes to memory, there's wonderful research of, say, Nicole Rust to ask if I show lots of images and I see at the same time the brain activity, mm -hmm. can I predict which stimuli you will remember and which ones you don't? And oh, so wow. there's the clear signature of what you remember. And yeah. I should just mention for people that are interested in behavior, because that's something that a lot of us can do. There's also beautiful research that links eye movements to both memory and decision making. So. Uh, so if I'm go if I decide between two products A and B or two things, mm -hmm. and I will end up choosing B, I will look at B much more often than I look at A. So and, and I don't think people will uh, people reflect at all on the fact that their eye movements actually give away of what they know and believe about the world. Uh, yeah, well, it's, I mean, people have been trying to decode that manually without you know neuron links you know for for years, right? And there's a I mean, but that with that information, it sounds like an advertiser's just you know, dream scenario right? to be able to, to really understand what images trigger, you know, attachment, memory, you know, all these sorts of things. 
Yeah, and they're of course very active trying to, to get those kinds of signals to be able to move that so we buy the things that they want us to buy. Okay, um, so have you considered like how people might communicate with an advanced version of this kind of thing? I mean, you talk about, you know, we, we're, we're seeing processing of images. How, how do we potentially get an image in one person's head into another person's head in a way that's comprehensible? Is that even, I mean, you know, like possible or, you know, what, uh, you're uh, laughing. I can see the laughter already. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, like, like the interesting thing that it, that that is kind of starting to be reality. Now, like I told you, when I, when we put people into an MI scanner, as a field, uh, people are starting to be able to kind of roughly decode the video that that person sees. Now you can say, if I can decode it, it means I can render it as a video. I can basically render what's happening in your brain, what you right. see as a video, and therefore I can There's already do that. Who can't? Who have don't have eyes getting vision through that sort of thing in in some places? Very. Yeah, there's there's, there's both directions. So like that's the thing that we call encoding. I take a video, I encode that in some way, I, I put it into your brain as electrical stimulation. That means mm -hmm. uh, that is encoding. Like I give you something that's on the outside. And then there's the decoding. I record from your brain and I run an algorithm on it to try and show someone else what it is that you're actually seeing. Mm -hmm. And so, so both are happening at the moment and people rapidly make progress at them. Okay, which in spite of you know people's method of decoding information being different than than everyone else. Okay, that's that's. that's... But, but but let me briefly zoom out of this a little bit. So if you listen to people like Elon Musk talk about mm -hmm. brain implants, they're always like, yeah, we could talk much faster with one another if we could both have prosthetic devices that kind of beam the information to one another. And I'm not so sure if I buy that because I believe that I can type actually faster than I can really think. And I believe that I can see things faster than I can process them. I, I can definitely type faster than I can think. I can. I, can, I have many, many uh, examples of that on Twitter for the public to see. Um, so I, that actually, though, uh, you know, what? So the fascinating thing here, you know, that you, you talk about this is, uh, the, the things you brought up in the talk uh, show me like a lot of room where we, we really do eventually need, you know, cross disciplinary activity here, you know, uh, both, you know, technical controls for how, you know, we can defend against these systems once they're actually in place. That kind of requires knowing what the technology will be before you can like, you know, deal with the, the ways to defend it. Uh, but also like legal, uh, you know, uh, uh, contributions for like how we make sure that it isn't okay, you know, from a legal perspective to, you know, put, uh, you know, a desire for a product in someone's brain. And yet it is okay to put, you know, something that, that a picture of the product in their brain, you know, this kind of thing, right? There's, it's difficult, right? These are hard questions. So uh, what's your sense from this field? Like, you know, how do, you know, we have a lot of people, I'm getting a lot of comments, a lot of interest. How do people who are interested in this, like, where is the field ready for that input? You know, what kinds of input are good to go today? Like, uh, or versus in five years or in, in 10 years? Do you have any sense of, you know, uh, who, who, who would you be looking to work with from the, the perspective of other disciplines? Yeah, let's briefly talk about the timeline. Now, like, uh, we yeah. are having stimulation devices in humans right now for diseases like Parkinson's disease. Yeah. Um, there's people very actively building to make that be very high dimensional. So, which means it's happening. And I don't, th and, and of course, neuroscientists like me, we are mostly interested in making stuff work. But <laughs> that means that if you want, like, we should be the customers of both the, of the legal, the ethical, and also the technical solutions of what it means. Now, like, if I, if I can interfere with your brain, what does it mean that my interference is something that you would find okay? It's, it's actually ethically quite interesting. Like, what what hacks of your own are you willing to accept as that's good? No, maybe you want to be motivated to read more books or something, quit smoking, but 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 you're clearly not willing to like only drink Coca Cola the rest of the future. So 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 I think that that in a way we are not asking for for help, but in parts it's because we don't know where this is all going. And I think that the rest of the world should start thinking slowly about it. 
absolutely agree. Uh, so thank you so much for, for putting this forward, uh, for sharing what you know with us. Uh, I, this is There's obviously a lot more questions, a lot more discussion, and from what I'm seeing, a lot more curiosity. Everybody, you know, put those questions in the Discord. Feel free to, to talk amongst yourselves. I don't know, maybe you know, Dr. Cording will even be able to, to uh, poke his nose in there and, and, and take some of it. But if not, at Cording Lab on Twitter, uh, you know, uh, now, obviously, he's shown himself to be a, a fellow who's very, you know, open to collaboration across disciplines and to kind of getting the word out about these issues. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks for having me.